Well, praise the Lord. That was it. That was only one person said amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much. Hey, it's good to have you all here today. Good to be in God's house. Well, let me just start off by saying that uh, I love Jesus. I love y'all, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to share with you today from God's Word. Now, I've entitled my message this morning, Do You Know? And Rid says on a regular basis, and I agree that the entire Bible ought to be taught, ought to be preached. And uh, he steps on our toes just about every Sunday morning, so I wasn't too worried about stepping on anybody's toes this morning. He preaches the hard stuff, and today, man, talk about stepping on something. <laughs> and <laughs> he preaches hard stuff, and today, I'm going to preach about something a lot of preachers don't and won't. Why? Because people don't like to hear about it. People don't like to hear about it. They don't, don't even like to discuss it. So what is it that one preacher refused to preach on because he said his church would fire him? Open your Bibles to Luke 16, 19. Luke 16, 19, and I'm pretty sure that you'll figure it out as we read it together. Luke 16, 19, but before we read God's word, pray with me, please. God, we just come to you this morning in Jesus' name, and we thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace. God, we thank you that you love us so very, very much. Your word tells us about how much you love us. God, help us to see that today. I pray that you would move in this place, Holy Spirit, that you'd bind Satan from this place and that you would give us ears to hear from you today. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Luke 16, 19 is the story about the rich man and Lazarus. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and he lived in luxury every day. What am I doing? Huh? The wire is moving. Not moving. Make a noise. We'll try that. He lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus. And Lazarus was covered with sores and he longed to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. And the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, that's the rich man, he looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things, and now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm. Great chasm has been set in places that those who want to go from here to you cannot nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. 
Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. You know, Jesus is telling this story and let me just stop there for a second because some people talk about stories in the Bible and the stories in the Bible are true stories. We have, a, we have this thing oftentimes where stories are or things that are made up, they're fantasies, they're things that are not real. The stories in the Bible are real. The stories in the Bible are true. And this story that Luke that we read about it, look, he did not say this was a parable. So perhaps it actually occurred. This story is different from the others that Christ told. You see in the parables, uh, excuse me, the story is different from others that Christ told. In the parables, spiritual things are represented by similitudes blurred from worldly things as with the sower and the seed. But here the spiritual things themselves are represented in a narrative or description of the good and bad in this world and in eternity. Jesus talked about heaven and here he talks about hell. As a matter of fact, Jesus talked about hell quite a bit. Why? Why would Jesus tell the story using hell as a place where people might possibly spend eternity? Well, I believe it's because Jesus, God in the flesh, is emphasizing the fact that God does not want anyone to perish. God does not want anyone to perish. You see, our Savior came to help us see another world. A world where we will spend eternity, a spiritual world. It's a matter of fact, and it happens almost every day that poor, godly people die in their miseries and uh, go to a heavenly place of bliss and joy. It's also a matter of fact that rich people who live in luxury and are unmerciful to the poor die and go to a place of torment. It just happens because people are people, good and bad, rich and poor. I don't hear what I didn't say. There's not anything wrong with money or being rich. But it's what you do with the money that God has given you. And it's how you treat the people that God has put in front of you that makes the difference. In this story, the word hell is used and we don't want to talk about hell. Now, this seems really funny to me because hell is a really common curse word. You hear it on TV, you hear it at work, in school, at the movies, in magazines, newspapers, almost everywhere you go. You see, hell is used and hell is talked about. Just not the correct way. So you ask, Brother Joel, why would you preach? Why are you preaching on hell? Let me share Matthew 18, 14. In the same way, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. That's why I'm preaching on hell. God does not want anyone to perish, neither do I. Is it wrong for me to warn you? Is it wrong for me to, to share with you what Jesus taught? This is a story that Jesus taught. Is it wrong for me to tell you about the coming judgment? Is it wrong? If you are drowning and I have the gospel lifeboat, I'm not going to let you drown. Suppose you're starving and I have the bread of life. I'm not going to leave you without something to eat. You're thirsty and I have the living water. I'm not going to let you die of thirst. And if you're lost, 
I'm not going to let you leave here today without showing you the way. I want to make it perfectly clear. God has given me a purpose. He has given me something that I know without a doubt he wants me to do, and that is to share the gospel, to share. And it is, and it is my aim, my aim in life to take as many people to heaven with me as I can. Amen? It is my aim in life to take as many people to heaven as I can by sharing what, what's taught in the Bible, by sharing God's love. You know, I looked at several different studies and approximately 71% of Americans say they believe in hell. Three-fourths, a little less than three-fourths. So what is hell? Well, according to those who say they believe in hell, 39% say it's separation from God. Pretty small percentage. But that's right. It is separation from God. 32% say it's an actual place of suffering or torment. Now you add that to the separation of God, now you got hell. 13% is just say it's just a symbol of an unknown bad outcome after death. Wow, that's an understatement. An unknown bad outcome after death? Oh, wow. That's scary. 16% that say they're not sure or they don't even believe in life after death. Now listen to this. Out of those who say they believe in hell, only 64%, two-thirds of say, the ones that say they believe in hell, two-thirds say they're going to go to heaven because they have asked Jesus to be their personal Lord and Savior. Amen. That's the right reason. But it's only two-thirds of the people. Wow. So what about all the rest of them? Well, 15% say they're going to go to heaven because they obey the Ten Commandments. Those, six, those 15% lied. Okay? So they just broke one of the Ten Commandments because you're not going to obey them. That's why God had to send his son. And 6% say it's because God loves me and he will not send me to hell. You know, I believe the Holy Spirit is here in this place this morning. And I believe every one of us need to hear this story that Jesus told. And we need to take this story to heart. Brothers and sisters, we need to be sure. We don't need to wonder. We don't need to guess. We need to be sure. Well, perhaps you're an unbeliever here today and you say, just leave me alone, preacher. Just leave me alone. I don't want to hear it. My answer is listen. Listen to me and listen well. Because this message is for you. God may just leave you to your bad self and then where will you be? Where will you be then? Well, preacher, we're not really lost and we're really not going to die. The devil said that to Eve in the Garden of Eden. When God said you will die if you eat from the fruit of the, of the forbidden tree, <laughs> the devil came and he whispered in Eve's ear through the serpent. And he said, you will not surely die. Satan is a liar. Satan is a liar. Listen, he's going down and he wants to take you with him. It's no accident that you're here today because this message is for all of us. Amen? Amen? This message is something we all need to hear. The rich man in this story has no name, but we are told he's dressed in fine linen. He lived a life of luxury. He lived in a way that he had everything at his fingertips. He had the best food and he had the best drink. He 
had servants that took care of everything he needed. He didn't want for anything. Even his dogs had him made. Well, we're not told that he was an evil man. We're not told that he got any of his wealth from, treating, from cheating anyone or treating anybody badly. We're not told if he went to the temple. We're not told if he gave any of his wealth to God. Now, the poor man did have a name. His name was Lazarus. Lazarus had to be brought to the rich man's gate. He had to be brought by others. He appears to be lame and he appears to be in poor health. He's covered with sores so much so most people wanted nothing to do with him. But the dogs came and licked his sores. He begged for even a crumb from the rich man's table. And this would have been what was left over after the dogs had had their fill. We're not told that he whined or complained when he's sitting outside the rich man's gate. We're not told if he ever made his way to the temple. And we're not told even if he would, even if he would have made his way, if he would have had anything to give. Verse 22 says that when the two men died, angels carried Lazarus to the place of paradise in Abraham's side. I wonder who carried the rich man to the place of torment. Whoever it was, I don't want to meet him because that's pretty scary. Also, the people in these two different places can apparently see each other across this great separation or gulf. So in this place of torment, the rich man looks across a great divide and he sees Abraham and Lazarus. Now, apparently he recognized Abraham, even though he had never met him. And of course, he recognized Lazarus. He had seen Lazarus begging many times outside his gate. In verse 24, we see the roles in the spiritual world to be reversed from the roles these two men had here on earth. In the spiritual world, this rich man is now begging for even a single drop of water. For a single drop of water. And here on earth, the poor man begged for even a crumb. The rich man is in hell and he's in agony, but he begs for mercy. But let me tell you something. There is no mercy in hell. Father Abraham tells him there's no way for anyone to go across this great chasm. So a drop of water's out of the question. So the, so the rich man, he becomes an evangelist. <laughs> Verse 27, that's right. Verse 27, 28. Please send Lazarus to tell my family. Please send Lazarus to tell my family, to tell my five brothers about this place of torment. He knew that Lazarus, that Lazarus knew where he lived. Hey, he wanted him to warn his brothers, to warn his loved ones about how just how bad this place really was. Hell is for real, folks. I don't care if 71% said they believe it or not. Hell is for real. Jesus would not have talked about it if it were not so. It would not be in the Bible if it were not so. I'm going to tell you something, and you can tune me out if you want to. But if this rich man were here today, he would say, confess your sin, repent, and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But he would say, please, please, do everything you can. But please, please, don't come to this place. But unfortunately, just like in the story, 
The rich man could stand up here this morning and he could tell you about how bad hell is. And listen to what I was going to say. Some people will walk out that door and still not believe. That's what Jesus said. So Abraham, Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Jesus used three words to describe hell. First, he used the word death. You see, God is life. And when you're separated from God, from the life of God, you are dead. Spiritually dead. Second, he used the word outer darkness. You see, God is light. And when you're separated from the light, you will be living in darkness. Third, he used the word fire. And I heard a preacher say that he wondered if it might be the fire that would burn in your heart to be in fellowship with God. And that fire can never be quenched. Because you are separated from God for eternity. Amos 4.12 says, prepare to meet your God. As human beings, we prepare for all kinds of things. But we never prepare for our death. We prepare for our education. We prepare for our careers, for our marriages, for our retirement. For old age but not for the moment of judgment. We take out every kind of insurance we can get and we're worried about our future and what's going to happen. But let me ask you a question this morning. Do you know? Do you have assurance of your relationship with Jesus? Do you know your sins are forgiven? Do you know? Let me share a couple of scriptures with you. Hebrews 9, 27. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. We will die. In James 4, 14, what is your life? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Oh, we know that other people are going to die We know other people are going to get sick. They're going to die with cancer. They're going to die in a car wreck. We act as if it'll never happen to us. We live as though we're going to live forever, but we're not, folks. It'll be over for all of us, some sooner and some later. But we all have an expiration date. Where, when you die, where will you be? Separated from God for eternity or with Christ in paradise? You know, on the day that Christ was nailed to the cross, there was a thief on the cross that was next to him. And that thief deserved to die under Roman law. And he admitted that he deserved the punishment that he was getting. But this sinner, this thief, he turned and he said this to Jesus. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, today you will be with me in paradise. Wow, Jesus took this man who deserved hell to paradise with him. Why? Because on the cross, 
On the cross, Christ was dying for people like him and people like you. But you might be here today and you say, well, he needed Jesus. I mean, after all, look at the kind of person he was. And you'd be right. You'd be 100% right. But the truth is, we all need Jesus. Amen? Can I get a better amen? amen. We all need Jesus. Amen. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned. It didn't say most have sinned, part have sinned, all but one. It says all. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, people like him are a lot easier to reach for Christ than people like you and me. You see, people like him have nothing and people like you and me, well, we're here today and we're dressed pretty nicely and we're in this nice building and some of us have been in church for years. Some of us know some scripture. In other words, we have a little bit of religion. And we think we're good to go. But religion will not get you into heaven. Religion will not get you into heaven. It's got to be a relationship. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. I love the fact that you will. It doesn't say you might be saved. It says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The Bible also says, everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. And I love the word everyone. It says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, it makes no difference who you are or what you've done. You can't be good enough and you will never be bad enough that God won't love you. Or that he'll love you anymore if you're good. God's free gift of forgiveness and eternal salvation is for every one of us. For every one of us. You don't believe me? John 3.16 says it all. For God so loved the world. That means you. That means you. Put your name in there. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You don't have to go to hell. You don't have to go to hell. You have a choice. You have a choice. You don't have to wonder about where you'll spend eternity. You can know for sure. You can know for sure. These things are written. Out of John, these things are written so that you may believe or know that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. I'm not making this up. This is right here. This is right here, and it's for each one of us. It's God's love letter to us. He, he gave us this so that we could know. So my question for you today is, do you know? Pray with me. Father, thank you for how you love us. Father, thank you for how you loved us when you gave us your son. Father, thank you For your sacrifice, giving your son for someone like me. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice, dying for someone like me. And Father, you didn't put any stipulations. You didn't put any, you have to do this, you have to, you just said believe. You made it so easy, but we make it so hard. So I pray this morning that you 
would move in this place, Holy Spirit, that you would have your way in our hearts, that we would listen to you. We, we came in with our own agendas. We came in with what we were going to do. I pray, God, that that would be out the window. And, God, that you would move here today. Holy Spirit, have your way in our hearts as we listen to you and allow you, allow you to guide what we're fixing to do during this time of invitation. And I ask this in Jesus' name. You know, you may ask yourself, you may ask yourself, well, Brother Joel, do you know? Let me tell you something. I know. I know without a doubt, and I'm positive 100%, I'm sure. I know where I'll spend eternity because I know who saved me. I know who died for me. I know who holds me in the palm of his hand. And one of these days you're going to read that Joel Shumay died. You're going to open up the newspaper and it's like, Joel Shumate's dead now. He died so long. Let me tell you something. Joel Shumate will be more alive than he ever has been. Because I'll be in heaven and I'll be jumping up and down on the streets of gold. I'll be walking hand in hand with Jesus and I'll be excited. And I will not be dead. I will be alive. Praise the Lord. I want you to be there with me. But the Bible's pretty clear. Jesus said it. I'm the way and the truth and life and no man comes to the Father except through me. So today, my invitation is, is, is pretty simple. If you don't know Jesus as your personal learned Savior, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day. We're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised, we're not promised an hour from now. And you know, I talk to the kids in VBS, it's like, do you know? And most, of the, and, and, and most of the kids, no, part of the kids said yes. But a bunch of kids said, I don't know. But they were truthful. Adults are not like that. Truthful, like, yeah, I know. And you have no clue. You need to know that you know. This morning, if you've never invited Jesus in your heart, come up here and let me talk to you and pray with you and tell you about my best friend. Maybe you've accepted Jesus at some point, but you've never been baptized. Come up here, I'll talk to you about it. Maybe you want to rededicate your life. You know, Joel, I've been, I've been pretty good. But I'm one of those people that's like, God's not going to send me to hell. It's like, you're right, you're going to send your help, yourself because God's just going to look at what you did. Maybe I need to rededicate my life. Today, today be the day. I don't know what God's talking to you about. Maybe he wants you to join Maybe you've been coming here for two weeks to two months uh, and you never joined. This is, a, this is the best church in Temple, Texas. I'm prejudiced. Yeah, okay. But this is the best church in Temple, Texas. Being a part of the body here at Memorial. Being a part of what God's doing here. That's what's important. However God's talking to you, whatever he's saying to you this morning... My invitation is plain and simple. Come. Whatever it is, come. As they play and the Holy Spirit talks to you, be obedient and come. Would you stand with me?